Welcome to the Green Parking Council webinar on Osram Sylvania's Lighting and Sustainability. This presentation is part of our continuing series of informational webinars on sustainable technologies and programs in parking facilities. I am Trevor Mead, Green Parking Council staff associate. First off, if you encounter any technical problems during the presentation, please email Gretchen Brown at Gretchen at GreenParkingCouncil.org or send a chat message to the presenters. Sustainable lighting offers parking garages a tremendous opportunity to lower their environmental footprint and electricity consumption. GPC partner, Osram Sylvania, is committed to helping parking facility owners and operators fully understand sustainable lighting solutions and have offered the expertise of two of their team members for today's webinar. Their presentation will address the factors that contribute to sustainable lighting, lighting controls and lowering energy consumption, the impact of legislation and building codes on lighting choices, and lamp recycling. Today's presenters from Osram Sylvania are Jennifer Dolan, Manager of Sustainability and Environmental Affairs, and Jeff Tiroler, LED Applications Specialist. Please enter any questions you may have into the chat box located on the left-hand side of your screen. We have allotted 15 minutes at the end of the webinar to go through the questions we received during the presentation. The webinar will run no longer than one hour. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Jennifer Dolan. Jennifer Dolan has been with Osram Sylvania since 2004, where she is the Manager of Sustainability and Environmental Affairs. She oversees environmental sustainability issues, including lamp and ballast recycling, greenhouse gas emissions reporting, and Osram Sylvania's Global Care Corporate Responsibility Initiatives. With over 20 years of experience developing public and private environmental policy, her areas of expertise include lamp recycling programs, green building methods, and solutions to combat climate change. Ms. Dolan spent 10 years with the United States Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, D.C. She holds a master's degree from Tufts University in Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning and a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, where she graduated summa cum laude. Our second presenter is Jeff T. Roller. Jeff T. Roller is an LED application specialist with Osram Sylvania. Mr. T. Roller received his Bachelor of Science in Engineering from Western Michigan University with postgraduate work in manufacturing engineering. Mr. T. Roller has spent the majority of his career as an automotive engineer developing and launching interior systems. He joined Sylvania in 2005 and helped develop LED retrofit and signage solutions for Michigan's and Florida's departments of transportation. Currently residing in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Mr. T. Roller travels the U.S. and Canada supporting outdoor, area, and parking LED lighting solutions. Jen? Thanks. Um, thank you, Trevor, and thank you to the Green Parking Council for um, hosting this webinar and inviting us to give it. Um, we're going to, uh, Jeff and I are going to kind of go back and forth on our presentation, so um, you may hear my voice and you may hear his at different times. Um, moving right along. Okay, so this you don't have to read. <laughs> Osram is in the um, current position of being spun off from Siemens, our parent company, and basically this is the required uh, language that says, I don't know anything, don't ask me. So moving on. Just to give you a quick overview of what Ostrom Sylvania produces and who we are, this slide just shows a quick summary of some of the types of products that we make, and we make everything lighting related. Consumer lighting, uh, most of you know in your homes. Specialty lighting includes both automotive and what we call display optic, which is actually uh, lighting for the entertainment industry. Our professional lighting includes fluorescent, lighting management systems, HID lamps, LED modules, drivers, all of the, the uh, lighting that goes into um, professional or what we call trade. And then our opto semiconductors group actually makes the discrete LEDs. And those are the things that go into products such as your uh, smartphone. So they're, they're making, they're the 
uh, second largest manufacturer of discrete LEDs in the country. All right. So just to also give you a few fun facts about Austrian Slovenia, we make some pretty cool things, and um, we do some pretty cool projects. One of the things that we've done several times now is give a gift to the nation. One of the gifts, the most recent gift, was the relighting of the National Mall in Washington, D.C. I already kind of touched on the Apple iPhone, but we do backlight those and many others. Uh, we have an alliance with Disney, and we actually have received two Academy Awards and one Emmy Award for film lighting. Some more fun facts. Another uh, gift to the nation was the relighting of the Jefferson Memorial, again in Washington, D.C. We also have Ostram, um, sorry, Slovenia Lighting Services, which is the number one lighting service company in the United States. And that's a turnkey approach to everything from auditing all the way to service maintenance and recycling of lamps. We make three out of four headlights in automobiles in the United States, and two-thirds of our products are manufactured in the U.S. And that's a fact we're pretty proud of. Okay. To give you an, a sense of, of Osram Slovenia's sustainability, we wanted to just go through that a little bit and then, then start to talk to you about lighting, specifically related to sustainability for uh, parking facilities. But just to, again, take a step back and give you a sense of who we are from a sustainability standpoint. This is a lot of, a lot of information on one slide, but what it basically says is that we have we're a leader in sustainability in our industry. We have a corporate platform, which Trevor mentioned before. It's called Global Care. We do produce a sustainability report, and you're more than welcome to, to view it online. It's at sylvania.com slash sustainability. Lots of other information is there. On the right-hand side, you can see some of the achievements, some of the things we're very proud of, including our sponsorship of the Green Parking Council. And in the middle of the slide, with the chart that has products and processes, this is a snapshot of some of the things that we have done to improve the products that we manufacture and the way that we manufacture them. Everything from um, extending the lamp life, and we'll go into that in a little bit, helping our customers with lead, um, and uh, producing LEDs and reducing the environmental impact overall of lighting. And on the other side, on the processes, we do have um, 17 facilities, manufacturing facilities in the NAFTA region, all of which are ISO 14001 certified all the way back to 2008. We look at our packaging, we look at our fleet and how we can improve um, or reduce the environmental impact of the close to 1,000 vehicles that we have through our service division. And that you, you can read this here, but um, you know, essentially improving our, our plants and looking at everything from, um, from the bottom down and the top, top down, bottom up, saying that right, in our uh, facilities and how we operate them. OK, so we're going to jump. We've got a lot of information, and, and I hope I'm not going too fast, but I so raise your hand or, or um, type in a comment or a question if you need me to slow down or if you've got questions along the way. I'll try and answer them as we go along if you do have questions. So let's start with sustainable lighting solutions. What do we mean by that? We look at um, high performance lighting is what we call it. And essentially, we're looking to do everything that you expect in a lighting system, but one, but making sure that we're we're reducing the environmental impact significantly, everything from the carbon footprint, disposal, operating costs. So, what exactly do we mean by that? 
there are lots of environmental factors to consider with lighting beyond just what most people consider as energy efficiency. Um, or, you know, everyone has their own idea of what environmental means when it comes to lighting. And there are lots of factors that, um, that go beyond just maybe the one that comes to, to everybody's mind. And there's no single factor that is the most important because everyone's going to have a different approach. Multiple criteria affect the environmental impact, how much energy is used, how many lamps you purchase, how much mercury and lead are in the systems, for example. And as I said, there's no lamp or system that will give you the best of everything. So you do need to evaluate, and Jeff is going to help you with that towards the end, to look at the best option for different applications, uh, both from the technology, but also from the environmental standpoint. So um, these are the top five that we look at, and these are in no particular order. So we'll, I'm, I want to just quickly go through these, and I do have a few more slides to highlight and touch on some of the key factors that are on this slide um, in the following slides. So when you use longer life lamps, you're prolonging your purchasing, you're requiring fewer lamps, fewer raw materials, and less need for disposal. Obviously, that's going to also give you a bottom line savings. Reducing the use of hazardous materials extends beyond just low mercury lamps. Lower mercury and lead levels in lighting products are important as are complying with state and federal regulations. Higher efficacy lamps, and efficacy means lumens per watt, also sometimes referred to as efficiency, but the term efficacy actually is defined as lumens per watt, how much light you're getting out for the energy that's going in. Um, when you have higher efficacy lamps, you're reducing the number of lamps that, that are used because you've got more light in a space. You may not need as many lamps. You can lower your energy needs and your associated carbon emissions as well as your operating costs. So these are just um, a few of these. Proper disposal we're going to touch at on at the end as well. And Jeff is going to uh, cover lighting controls when we get to that point. Um, but lighting controls really is focused on energy efficiency and reducing energy consumption. Proper disposal is keeping that mercury and lead from entering the environment at the end of life. Okay, so going to really specifically some of these in more detail. Energy savings, carbon emissions. We get a lot of, oh yeah, energy savings, uh, saving energy saves the environment. We hear that a lot. And then when pressed, a lot of people can't really explain what that means. So I'm going to give you the, the quick version so you can impress your friends and family. Um, in the United States, 42% um, of our electricity is generated by coal-fired power plants, which emit air pollution, pollutants such as carbon dioxide, particulate matter, and mercury directly into the environment. And you can see here you've got natural gas at a, another 25% and petroleum at 1%. So the amount of fossil fuels, petroleum, natural gas, and coal, burned by power plants to generate electricity in this country is pretty huge. Now we're not talking all energy, it's just electricity. Um, reduced electricity loads can directly affect power plant emissions. So you burn less fossil fuels if there's less energy or electricity needed. Uh, the demand is less, so the generation is less. And that's how you, you correlate your carbon footprint and environmental impact. Because when you're um, putting, when the power plant is burning less fossil fuel, putting less carbon dioxide in the environment to meet that demand. That's the carbon footprint. Lower that demand, lower that emissions, your carbon footprint comes down. And as we know, lighting accounts for about 95% of a parking structure's annual energy cost. So obviously 
I don't need to tell any of you that that's a key driver. But redu again, reducing your, your electricity needs, reducing your energy consumption, your electricity consumption through lighting, you're going to reduce your carbon footprint as well. Okay, this slide, it's a little hard to read, but um, I'm going to walk you through it. <laughs> it's a great chart. Uh, it was done several years ago by McKinsey, and they did a study to identify lots of options a country could take to slow or reverse the effects of global climate change. They mapped all the options on this chart, and the degree of abatement or reduce, reduction is depicted by the width of each bar, and the cost is depicted by the height of each bar. Those above that horizontal line have a high cost of implementation per ton of CO2 equivalent reduced, and those below the line have a high return on investment per ton of CO2 equivalent reduced. So what you can see here, circled in red um, towards the left-hand side, the third, fourth, and seventh bars with the highest rate of return are lighting-related. So of all the things that they looked at, of all the things they could do, we could do as a country uh, to reduce our, our national carbon emissions or our national footprint, uh, carbon footprint, numbers three, four, and seven are the biggest bang for the buck, and they're all re lighting related. Um, okay, they're also constantly improving. Lighting is one of those things. Where that is constantly innovating and reducing payback time. So a favorite saying in lighting is that low hanging, this, lighting is the low hanging fruit, but we like to say that low hanging fruit grows back. So it's worth reinvesting periodically. So just because you, you improved your lighting at one point doesn't mean that it's not another, a good time to revisit it because of the technological innovations in lighting. Okay, um, we're going to switch over now to lighting controls, and Jeff is going to take this section. Excellent. Thanks, Jen. Uh, lighting controls consist of much more than the standard occupancy sensor. A full energy management system touches on six specific areas or strategies of lighting control and offers the next generation of lighting efficiency technology beyond basic lamp ballast upgrades. Collectively, these opportunities reduce lighting-related energy costs by 50 to 79 percent. Specifically, these six systems offer differing levels of savings. Smart time scheduling allows switching or dimming in zones or individual rooms or fixtures and can achieve 10 to 50 percent energy savings. Daylight harvesting can be employed to automatically lower lighting levels when ambient lighting can compensate and save 17 percent in energy usage. Task tuning allows a user to set a maximum level of light in a particular task, saving 28% of the associated lighting electricity use. Occupancy sensors are what most people think of when they think of lighting controls, turning off lights or lowering light levels when no motion or heat signature is detected. And for good reason, it's a simple strategy that can save 35% in lighting usage. Giving individuals personal control over their lighting, allowing them to turn off or dim their workspace has shown to save 38%. In variable load shedding, often called demand-side management, typically coordinating with utilities to reduce energy use slightly during times of peak load consumption, can lower lighting usage at further 10%. Collectively, on the high end, the potential savings can be up to 79% of the lighting-specific electricity usage. However, this quote taken from the DOE sums it up well. It's not just about having controls. It's about having the right controls for your application and optimizing those controls to maximize your savings. There are many different controls architectures including wireless, independent modules, power line control, and more. Is it a proprietary technology which locks you into a certain hardware? Does your parking garage solution communicate with the solution you utilize in the rest of your facility? What's right for your application short and long term? Controls expertise is one of the critical elements of a successful installation. Okay, back to me. Thanks. 
Um, okay, let's focus on fluorescent and HID technology for a minute. Both require a tiny amount of mercury to operate efficiently. Mercury has received a lot of negative attention lately, so I wanted to put this in context. Before I go to the next slide, I want everyone to think of a fluorescent lamp and think about how much mercury you think is in it. Keep in mind that just this week, we uh, Sylvania won an award at Light Fair, our big industry trade show, for our fluorescent lamp that now lasts 84,000 hours. So thinking of that amount of mercury you think might be in there, this slide puts it in a little bit of context. This, this is the little bead on the left, the arrow is pointing to, is the mercury dose. It's the average, well, it's actually what we think is the average in the industry for a four-foot fluorescent lamp, three to four milligrams, and it fits in Lincoln's eye on a penny. So lots of people see that and they think, boy, I thought it was a whole lot more. Uh, but that's about it, and, and we're extending lamp life as well as reducing that amount of mercury. Now, mercury is um, not important to energy efficiency, but it can affect lumen output. You need enough mercury for both initial light output and more importantly, to maintain that light output as we extend the lamp life especially. Every time you turn on that lamp, you're using up, so to speak, I put that in quotes, because the mercury is an element, but you're essentially using up a bit of mercury to operate that lamp. And mercury as an element can't be destroyed, can't be created, but it does uh, get essentially, um, we call it used up in the lamp because it will be absorbed by other parts of the lamp and won't be available to act um, as it needs to in that lamp. So if the mercury dosing is too low, the lamp life, the number of starts, the color, light output can be dramatically affected. As we can see in this pretty picture, <laughs> a pink lamp typically means that there's no more mercury left available to excite the phosphorus and to turn ultraviolet light into visible light. Without energy efficient mercury containing lamps, you can't meet wattage per square foot levels required by building codes. And, but I want to also put this issue in context in the big environmental picture. This slide is what I call use a little, save a lot. And this is a simple table to, describe, to demonstrate the environmental impact of two different technologies related to mercury. Uh, this is the five-year mercury contribution from a four-foot T8 lamp on the left incandescent lamp, similar light output on the right. Now remember earlier on I mentioned that power plants are burning fossil fuels to generate electricity and that one of the pollutants that are going up the smoke st the, the stacks of the power plant is mercury. Mercury is embedded in coal and other fossil fuels. When it's burned it goes up in the environment. The blue section shows you how much mercury is in a lamp, and you can see on the right there's no, no mercury in an incandescent. But look how much airborne mercury is emitted from power plants burning that fossil fuel to generate the electricity to run each of these lamps. Incandescent lamp contributes four times more power plant mercury emissions than, than a fluorescent. So again, use a little mercury in a lamp to save a lot from the power plants. And mercury we've been talking about, but the other hazardous material used in lighting is lead. Lead's typically used in solder. It's in the glass bulbs and tubes of many lamp products. Um, this is a, a little shameless plug, but we did, we we're pretty proud of under our global care environmental platform, one of our commitments that we fulfilled in 2010 was to take all the lead out of most of our lamps specifically the fluorescent lamp production in Versailles, Kentucky. Um, our furnace there now burns completely lead-free. So that was an accomplishment we were pretty proud of. Um, and we've reduced the, or eliminated the lead. And that's where the industry is going. You know, this is just to show you what we've done. 
Okay, lamp disposal. So now we've talked about what goes in the lamp. And lamp disposal is important because it's also regulated. In 1999, the US EPA classified mercury-containing lamps as universal waste, which is a subset of hazardous waste that was intended to reduce the administrative and transportation burdens to make lamp recycling easier. Most states actually didn't interpret it that way, but most states adopted the universal waste rule, meaning that the generator of the waste is identified as the responsible party for proper disposal. Again, different interpretation of what proper disposal means, but in any case, in all the uh, states, the generator, the user of those lamps, is responsible for the disposal. As of this webinar, the date of this webinar, there are 11 states that have mandatory disposal bans for mercury-containing products, meaning that fluorescent and HID lamps cannot be added to the solid waste stream and have to be kept out of landfills and incinerators. And some of those you can see here, I don't need to read them, but some of them are just commercial, some are commercial as well as household. There are no states that are household only. Uh, and, and I want to point out that many other municipalities within other states have uh, regulations about lamp disposal. Washington State, for example, is not on this list, but King County, which is 50%, um, that's where Seattle is, 50% of the population of Washington lives in King County, and they do have a disposal ban. So it's very important that you look at your local as well as state laws. And of course, uh, lamp recycling is the best way to comply with any of these laws and the most responsible method for disposal. There is a robust lamp recycling industry throughout the country. They have specialized equipment to properly handle mercury-containing lamps. The lamps are separated into their components under vacuum to contain the mercury. Metals are collected in one bucket, phosphorus separated from the glass, which is crushed, and the glass gets sold off here, and, and the mercury gets retorted, heated up, and then cooled back down to return to its elemental state. That gets resold, metals get sold, so everything is actually um, reused or resold, but it does cost more to recycle than the value of the materials that are collected. So there is, a, um, there is a cost to recycle, but it ends up being about 1% of the cost of ownership of those lamps. So it's certainly worthwhile, and it keeps you away from any lawyers. OK, so we've talked about many of the key environmental factors, efficacy and lighting controls, uh, hazardous materials, disposal, um, and lamp life. And there are other, those are the five, as I said in the beginning, those are the five major factors, but there are lots of other things to consider. Um, and this slide just highlights some of them. Recycled materials, um, the term recycled is kind of catch-all, pre-consumer means essentially you've got an industry that has stuff that falls on the ground and you throw it back in the process before it ever reaches the consumer. That's still considered recycled because it's not ending up in a landfill. Post-consumer is pretty much what you, when you put your stuff at your curbside bin after you've used it and it goes back into a process to be made into other materials. Um, that's post-consumer recycled materials. And glass, metals, mercury, they can all be um, they can all contain recycled content or have recycled content. Packaging is probably the most recyclable material, and there's um, there's a drive to to using more recycled and recyclable materials in packaging. Transportation is also important to consider. Cube efficiency and routing efficiency. When cube efficiency means being able to put more product on a truck and get uh, have fewer trucks out there burning less diesel or gasoline and emitting less into the environment. Routing efficiency will do the same. 
speed management, no idling policies, again, to reduce the amount of emissions from, transport, from, from trucks, essentially. Um, and then you know, we, the location of manufacturing distribution centers. If you have them local, again, less amount of, uh, or fewer miles a truck has to deliver those products. Made in the USA, again, one of our favorites because we do manufacture in the United States. But that is a consideration when you think of all of the products being ma manufactured overseas and being brought into this country. So to reduce an environmental impact, you want your product to be manufactured, um, warehouse delivered as close to you as possible. Okay, lighting application. I'm going to turn this over again to Jeff. Oh, Great. thanks, okay, Jen. All right. Um, LEDs offer incredible benefits as a light source. We know a little something about this technology as we are the second largest global producer of LEDs and LED drivers. After 40 years of producing LEDs, we understand how to make a product last. LEDs are capable of very long life with as much as 70,000 to 100,000 hours for white LED systems. In fact, most properly designed LED systems are not limited by the life of the LED, but by the life of the other electronics in the system, namely the LED driver. At the same time, fluorescent technology can now reach 84,000 to 100,000 hours life, so for ultra-long life applications, there are options. LEDs can have very high efficacy with as much as 80 to over 100 lumens per watt possible at the system level. LEDs can also be very efficient because of the directional nature of, of most LEDs. We can direct the light pretty close to where we want it to go and avoid wasted light or light trespass. This allows us to light more area more evenly with fewer lumens and less wattage. This is a distinctive advantage of properly designed LED systems. And because of their compact size, LEDs are tremendously versatile. They offer the possibility of, to create designs in extreme form factors or other with dynamic color changing, for example. They are easy to switch, dim, and offer environmental benefits including mercury and lead free. There are benefits and drawbacks to each lighting technology. You know, some of the advantages of LED include highest optical control for uniformity, low energy use, and highly controllable. Some of the disadvantages include high initial costs and glare potential. However, as LED technology continues to evolve, we are seeing solutions for various issues. For example, Eco Parking Lights, located just outside of Indianapolis, Indiana, has developed a low-glare parking garage LED solution through innovative use of optics and serviceable LED modules. This is an innovative solution for, for glare. Linear fluorescence, some of the advantages are low initial cost, low glare, controllable with good CRI, disadvantages, less optical control limit spacing, and they can be sensitive to cold. Inductive fluorescent, some of the advantages is ultra-long life and low glare. Disadvantages, less optical control can limit spacing, and they too can be uh, sensitive to cold. Ceramic metal halide. Metal halide is also advanced. Some of the advantages is easy to retrofit for high pressure sodium, high optical control for uniformity, and good color rendering. Disadvantages is the restrike time limits control, shorter rated life, glare potential, and typical high energy consumption. This slide was taken from a project done just about two years ago. At that time and for this application, the linear fluorescent solution was the best choice for this customer. This is the type of an, uh, excuse me, this is the type of analysis which needs to be conducted to ensure you capture the complete life cycle cost for the various options you are considering. You will note that since this project, all technologies have continued to advance. LEDs get the most visibility, but linear fluorescence, for example, have which used to have a rated life of 36,000 hours. Today they are available in 84,000 hour lamp life. Costs of the emerging technologies have continued to go down and controls are becoming more and more efficient at maximizing the performance of each system. An objective assessment is necessary to understand which technology is best for your application. Uh, I'm actually going to quickly go back because there's one point I want to make before we talk about legislation, which is the next slide, that um, this this uh, chart was designed or shows you all of the costs without rebates. And 
one of the things that is important to consider, obviously, and I'm sure all of you know this, is looking at local and state utility rebate programs, um, and the, as well as federal. And I'm, there is a federal rebate, pro, or not rebate, a federal tax incentive program that does end at the end of this year. So that is something that um, that you know, needs to be considered and factored into your payback. Um, so here you have the legislation and the impact on your lighting choices. There are a few federal regulations and energy code requirements that might affect your current and future lighting choices. The recent federal activity has required lamps, incandescent, halogen, fluorescent, um, and we have four more in the works uh, to be more efficacious, which has prompted the phase out of many types of lamps that many of you have purchased for quite some time. Meaning that lighting is is getting more efficient, being driven both from the manufacturing industry, but also from the federal government. And building energy codes, ASHRAE 90.1 2010 in particular, not only has stricter lighting power density limits for various space types, but as you'll see in the next slide here, the 2010 version requires controls. And they are required in all applications. So that also drives the, the need to consider what fixtures you're putting in, what um, controls make sense for your particular facility. And you can see here Title uh, 24 in California, they're always noodling with that one. So that's constantly, um, you know, right now, photosensors, um, other control technol or, or tr controls are being required in parking lots and garages. One other key point that I, I wanted to mention on a previous slide, the first one that I'm actually going to go back to it. Um, sorry for doing this. I don't usually do this, but I do want to. Whoops, I'm sorry. Point this out. Um, that last bullet there, likely to be added. This is LEDs likely to be added to e-waste legislation in the future. Again, that goes back to the the legislative conversation we were just having. E-waste is electronic waste, typically computers, monitors, video consoles, anything that is electronic gadgetry. 25 states in this country have requirements about disposal of those um, products. And this is just Sylvania speculating, but because of what the technology of LEDs and the fact that they are semiconductor chips, they are electronics, essentially, um, we fully expect that at some point they will be included in disposal legislation. So that's just kind of a, a thing to keep in mind, once again, considering not just what you're buying, but how you're going, going to dispose of it at the end of life, which may be regulated or legislated in the future. Okay, so we wanted to give you um, a good sense of, of sustainability in lighting, but also give you an opportunity to ask questions at the end. So we have about 15 minutes, I guess, for questions. And, oh, I'm sorry, oh. I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> this is our contact information, and thank you. <laughs> um, Sorry, Trevor. <laughs> Don't look uh, So, first, first question: If you could speak a little bit more to the rebates and how they play a role in the decision-making process for property owners, should, are they are there more of them that are technology agnostic, or is that something that a facility owner would want to look at and see the rebates available in their area and make their decision on lighting technology based on that? Um, yeah, the, well, I'll, I'll start, Jeff, you can jump in if you've got more. Um, the, the local utility rebates, um, are, you have to look at, at each 
each state, each locality or municipality is going to be different. Many mm -hmm. of them focus on the technology and they'll rebate X dollars per fixture. You know, you may get forty dollars for an LED fixture. That's totally hypothetical. You may get um, you know, five dollars for every exit sign, LED exit sign. It may be technology and product specific, but some utilities may also give you um, rebates for energy efficiency. And the federal uh, building tax incentive works on a um, reduction in energy usage. It's X percent over uh, or better than ASHRAE. And the more you can, uh, the more efficient, the, the higher the reduction, the more money you can claim. And it's up to, I believe it's 60 cents square foot. Jeff, do you recall that? We have it on our website um, under legislation, the sylvania.com slash sustainability. It's in the legislation section. We have that um, all. Uh, a, a whole section where you can actually go through and do a calculation and, and see what your tax deduction might be. But it is based on ASHRAE and um, improvement above ASHRAE for either the building method or the space-by-space -space method. Jen, if I could comment on that. Um, one of the things that we have available, one of the resources that we have available is we have five people dedicated full-time to helping customers identify rebates. And sometimes rebates can be a little complicated to understand, a little complicated to actually obtain. And um, you know, they come in different classifications. Some of them are um, yeah, uh, custom. Some of them are prescriptive. And some of them will come from the uh, generating utility. Some of them are, are managed by a, um, an independent agency hired to manage the overall rebate program. So, and then of course there's rebates as well as grants. And, uh, and so anyway, so is one of the resources that we have available is to help customers identify what rebates are available in their, uh, in their particular area so that they can maximize that, that savings. Okay, th thank you. The next question is, you had mentioned, Jen, that the low-hanging fruit grows back. How often should a parking facility owner or operator look into doing a lighting retrofit? And, Realize the sustainability or the energy and the energy efficiency of their lighting system. Excellent question, and um, I'm going to let Jeff answer that one as well. I think you know. I think really what it comes down to, and I run into this a lot because, uh, as you mentioned early on, I travel throughout the U.S. and Canada supporting customers on a variety of projects, and. Um, and what I find is, is that we get into that kind of that debate of uh, it's kind of the computer debate. When do you up upgrade your computer? And um, and really, it comes down to is when it financially makes sense. I think, you know, if I was uh, an owner operator, I would probably want to take a look at the technology every couple of years just to make sure that I'm staying in tune with the evolution of the technology, as well as the controls, as well as the uh, regulations, as well as the rebates. And, um, and so I think having some resources or having, for instance, this, this type of an opportunity to stay current with what's going on technology-wise, uh, regulatory-wise, uh, rebate-wise, I think is a, a good way to stay on top of it. Once you actually do a retrofit, uh, in most cases you're not going to be uh, looking at any kind of significant maintenance for 8, 10, 12, you know, 15 years really depending on what the technology is that you use, as well as your utilization of, of controls. You can extend, for instance, the life of products through the utilization of controls, and, and Jen talked on some of those things, and I talked on some of them as well as far as different, different strategies. So I think staying in tune at least every couple of years, making sure you're staying on top of the technology and, and what funding is available to help you fund a conversion. Um, and then, of course, once you make the conversion, you're going to enjoy uh, quite a few years of low to no maintenance as a result. Okay, thank you. And um, on to the lamp recycling and disposal. So the states where it's not mandatory, there's still the opportunity when if you're going to get rid of your lighting, I'm assuming, to, to go through the recycling process. Is that something that um, property owners should work, work through with their 
lighting manufacturers, um, lighting vendors, installers? How, how, what's the first step for a property owner who's looking to re recycle their existing lighting technology? Yep, excellent question. Um, yeah, the, the intent of the law was actually to, it, to reduce the burden or ease the burden to recycle. And as I said, the interpretation was, oh, these can be just thrown in the solid waste stream, which is actually not the case. Um, so all of the mercury containing lamps should be recycled. And our Sylvania Lighting Services, actually, we had mentioned that one of the things that they do with every contract is include recycling. So they will collect all of the lamps, and they have a contract with a lamp recycler, a national lamp recycler, to properly recycle those lamps. Uh, anyone who you know, is not using a service maintenance company should work with a, um, a certified lamp recycler. And we have a, again, on our website, sylvania.com slash sustainability, we have um, information about lamp recycling, a link to SLS, as well as a link to a, another company that we work with called Veolia Environmental Services. And there's also a list of lamp recyclers. They have their own industry um, association. It's ALMR, Association of Lighting the Mercury Recyclers. Um, so, I mean, I would say the, the first thing you would want to do is consider a service and maintenance contract with SLS, obviously, shameless plug, but you know, they, they do a great job in start to finish um, with the um, turnkey operation, and lamp recycling is part of that. So it's one less thing to have to worry about. Thank you, Jen. So that's all the questions that have come in um, so far. So I'd like to move on, thank our presenters for taking the time out of their day to educate us on lighting sustainability. Their information helps us to gain a greater understanding of sustainable lighting solutions. As of tomorrow morning, this presentation, as well as our panelists' contact information, will be available on the Green Parking Council website. I encourage you to reach out to Jennifer or Jeff with any questions that were not answered today or additional questions that come up. And in, in addition, if you could please email me any suggestions you have for future Green Parking Council webinars at trevor at greenparkingcouncil.org. Thanks for joining us.